Hi, this is Jerry. Did you know that March is National Women's History Month? This year's theme is celebrating women who tell our stories. So as a special bonus, I'm republishing episode 264, The History of Women in the FBI. I hope you'll listen or re-listen to the show, especially to understand the significance of the FBI's recent pledge to advance women in policing. The National 30 by 30 pledge aims to bring more women into policing to improve public safety, community outcomes, and trust in law enforcement. I updated the episode's show notes to include a link to the press release about the pledge. Now, cue the music. Welcome to episode 264 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. July marks the 50th anniversary of women FBI agents. And to commemorate this historic milestone, today you'll hear from active and retired agents about the history and contributions of female special agents. For me, it's almost inconceivable, almost, that at one time in our history, women could not be special agents. I'll let former FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover explain this prior policy to you. It is not the intent of the FBI to confine the special agent position to males without there being very good reason to do so. Lurking in the minds of those bent on defying the law must be the ever-present concern for the prowess and the ability of the FBI agent. The response by our agents must be quick and is frequently military in nature with one man supported by others, making the initial move, such as bounding into a room. He must create the impression that he is intrepid, forceful, aggressive, dominant, and resolute. Our work involves basically man against man and is a body contact profession. That, of course, was not really FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, but it was a 1971 policy statement of Hoover's, read by my favorite son-in-law, Sean Quigley. Now, despite what Hoover believed and everything he did to prevent women from joining the FBI as agents, here we are today celebrating the 50th anniversary of women agents. But this milestone applies only to modern-day women agents. If we go all the way back to the early years when the FBI was known simply as the Bureau of Investigation, this year, 2022, will actually be the 100th anniversary of women special agents because the very first female agents were hired between 1922 and 1924. As a matter of fact, They were on staff prior to J. Edgar Hoover being named acting director on May 10th, 1924. The first woman hired as a special investigator, special agent, was Alaska Davidson. She was appointed on October 11th, 1922. Her duties were the detection and prosecution of crimes. On May 26th, 1924, acting director Hoover requested Davidson's resignation because of a reduction in the workforce. Her resignation was accepted on June 10th, 1924. The second woman hired as a special agent was Jessie Duckstein. She began her career with the FBI as a stenographer typist and then as the confidential secretary to Bureau Director William J. Burns. Duckstein began training as an agent in November 1923. Acting Director Hoover also requested 
Agent Duckstein's resignation, stating again that there was to be a reduction of force. Her resignation was accepted on May 13, 1924. So basically, Director Hoover was appointed on May 10th, and these two women were shown the door by the end of May. As a trained investigator, I think there might be a connection, don't you? I learned about Agents Davidson and Duckstein from an article written by Lynn Vines, published in the FBI's The Investigator magazine. You can read the entire article in this episode's show notes. And then there is Lenore Houston, the only woman hired and fired as a special agent by Director Hoover. I'm going to have retired agent Jane Mason help me tell Special Agent Houston's FBI story. So, Jane, when Hoover became acting director in 1924, there were two women that were already special agents. And he did something. But the next thing we know, he has their letters of resignation and they're no longer special agents. But there was one woman, Lenore Houston, who remained on staff as a special investigator that People were in her corner or making recommendations for him to make a special agent. You've done a lot of research on that. So my first question for you is why you wanted to do research on Lenore Houston and what did you find out? Well, after I retired from the FBI as a special agent in 2014, it was Women's History Month. And I said, I want to start doing some research on the first females in the FBI. And I really didn't know very much about the first females, except for the females that came in starting in 1972, which happened just after Hoover's death. And interestingly, in the FBI records that I obtained through Freedom of Information, Lenore Houston actually was assigned to the position of special agent by J. Edgar Hoover. And she is the only woman who he ever, ever designated as a special agent at the FBI. The first, the last, and the only female. So she's my heroine. And I know about her because I was in the Philadelphia office and actually that's where she worked. And so there was uh, some information in the office that I collected during the FBI's 100th anniversary. Tell us what you learned about her. Lenore applied to the position of special agent in 1922, and she was hired by the FBI, but as a special employee, not as a special agent. So from 1922 to 1924, Lenore had a few people sort of as her cheerleaders who were lobbying the FBI to change her designation from special employee to special agent. One of the most vocal was U.S. Congressman George Graham from Pennsylvania. And you can see in the FBI records, there are many calls and many handwritten notes that Congressman Graham made and sent to the Bureau, asking the Bureau to designate Lenore Houston as a special agent. And eventually, again, in the FBI records that I obtained, Edgar Hoover wrote a note saying that it was his decision to make Lenore Houston a special agent of the FBI. And at that time, Hoover was acting director of the FBI. Do you really think it was his decision? I really do not think it was his decision. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think so, too. You've shared those documents with me. And the fact that the conversation went on for several months of requesting that this be done before he actually did something makes me think that there was a resistance. And of course, you know, he had had those other two women resign as special agents, indicating that he was tightening the criteria for FBI agents and wanted them mostly to be certified accountants and members of the bar. And next thing you know, here she comes. Here she comes. And it was shortly after he had asked for the resignation of the other two female uh, special agents. So that adds to the belief that there was a lot of pressure put on J. Edgar Hoover to actually hire Lenore Houston as special agent. And from your review of records, what did she do as a special agent? What was her area of expertise? 
After her training, she was assigned to work white slave law violations, which is the Mann Act. I think it had to do with prostitution and, and interstate transportation of females. Yeah, I guess nowadays we might even call some of that, you know, human trafficking or sexual trafficking. Exactly. So that tells us right there that Lenore Houston was a badass working those type of violent violations. Absolutely. One other document I thought was so interesting, and you also allude to it a little bit in your writing, but one of the documents that I found in the FBI cache was a document that said that Lenore Houston would be earning $3,100 per year on the detection and prosecution of crimes. And I thought that was so interesting because back then that's probably a pretty decent salary. Yeah. Another one of the documents that you shared with me indicated that when she became a special agent from being a special employee, that her compensation didn't change. Did you see that one? Right. It didn't change. It was just the title. That was it. So again, that's me speculating that mm -hmm. Hoover really didn't want to do it. So he gave her the title, but no more pay. No more pay. A number of documents indicated that later in her career, she was getting pay increases and grade increases and, you know, doing quite well in her new position. Yes. The other thing that I wanted to mention, too, in addition to the congressman, the governor of Pennsylvania was also in favor of having Lenore Houston become a special agent. And the records show that he did contact the Bureau on a few occasions, try to push them into that direction. The final correspondence, which is dated October 30th, 1924, which seems to be the pivot point for J. Edgar Hoover to make his decision to allow Lenore Houston to become a special agent. The letter is actually signed by two different people. First is Congressman George Graham, which we already spoke about, but the other is the Honorable Ward F. Martin. And he was the special assistant attorney general at the time. So to me, it shows that Lenore Houston had some pretty powerful men backing her to be in the position of special agent. Yeah, definitely. And we have no idea why. I mean, I that, that's a mystery. It's fantastic that she had that type of support, especially with the resistance that she was obviously receiving from Hoover, who, as we both mentioned, had just asked two other women to resign from that position. So these powerful men who, who backed Lenore Houston were able to get him to do something it appears he didn't want to do. Precisely. At first, Lenore was doing a very good job at the Bureau and she got exceptional ratings for her work product. But over time, and just before she left the Bureau in 1928, her ratings were not as stellar as they were at the beginning. She was also taking a tremendous amount of leave. She was just not coming into work at all for a while. And in late 1928, she was asked to resign and she submitted her resignation papers. She was only a special agent for a little over four years. That's the mystery. What was it that made that change for the first two years where we see these documents where she was getting grade increases in 1925 and 1926? We don't see anything in 1927, but in 1928, there are all of these memos to the file as if somebody was as we used to say as agents, keeping book on her, you know, sending memos to the file about all the time she was taking off from the job. And interestingly, many of those memos are written by J. Edgar Hoover himself. And you would think that as the director of the FBI, he would be too busy to write memos to the file about the one female special agent who was taking leave. But uh, he wrote several and one of the things that I always think about is the isolation and the harassment that she could have. And again, I'm speculating, but that she could have endured being in a position where the head of the entire agency, the director of the FBI, is not happy that she's there. All information points to the fact that he was very unhappy that she was there. And you could almost say from reading all the memos that he sent to the file that he was, quote unquote, gunning for her job because documenting someone that often, that frequently by somebody who's the top level of the Bureau of Investigation at the time, 
really is saying something. I'm sure he didn't write memos to file on every single agent that worked for him. So you're right. It's a mystery and it's fascinating. Now, one of the things that I find extremely fascinating is not in the official bureau records, but I found this in the Philadelphia office, a chief of clerks, a a position that they no longer have in the bureau, but the chief of clerks had written a report about the history of the Philadelphia office. And in it, there was the most interesting line. It says a report dated December 30th, 1930, indicates that Miss Houston, formerly Special Agent Lenore Houston, was confined to a hospital and that she was suffering hallucinations and had threatened to shoot Hoover as soon as she was released. Wow. Isn't that interesting? And what came first? Did she have mental issues and therefore be asked to resign from the FBI? Or did the agents she worked with in Hoover just drive her crazy? Right. Did they drive her to madness? (laughs) Who knows? I wish we could learn the truth about that story, but I doubt that we ever will. But yeah, she's just a fascinating human being in the history of the FBI. You can view some of the documents Jane received from her Freedom of Information and Privacy Act, FOIPA, request in the show notes. After Lenore Houston's resignation or firing, whatever you want to call it, there were no more women hired as special agents during J. Edgar Hoover's 48-year tenure as director of the FBI. Hoover believed women could not handle the demands of the position and he frequently justified his views in writings and correspondence. Special Agent Christina Reband of the Chicago Division spoke with me about the infamous Hoover letter that has been passed around and filed and framed by generations of female FBI agents. I was first introduced to this infamous Hoover letter about six, seven years ago when I had a female supervisory special agent who had it on her door. I was an intelligence analyst at the time, and I remember stopping to look at it, wondering if it was, wondering if it was real. It looked like it had been photocopied so many times. And when I asked my supervisor about it, she said, oh yeah, this has been passed down from generation to generation of female agents to remind ourselves that we now hold positions that we were once not allowed to have. Here's Sean Quigley again, this time reading the letter Hoover wrote to Miss Nancy McRae in Hartford, Connecticut on April 16, 1971. Dear Miss McRae, I was glad to learn from your letter received on April 13th that you are interested in a career in the FBI and enclosed are publications regarding the opportunities available and requirements for employment with us. Because of the nature of the duties our special agents are called upon to perform, we do not employ women in this position. We must have agents who are qualified to cope with any situation they may face. As you will see, however, women do hold many important positions in this bureau. Sincerely yours, John Edgar Hoover. I stared at it because I I didn't know if it was real. I felt bad for... This lady, Nancy, who Hoover wrote to, because it seemed as if Hoover kind of crushed her dreams in her wanting to become an agent. I also questioned the authenticity of it. Like, would Hoover actually write some lady a letter denying her a special agent job in in the FBI? From there on out, I kind of always just wanted to know who Nancy was. So it was March of 2021. I was sitting at my desk. I'm, I'm now a special agent. And I started staring at the letter again. I was reading the body of it over and over. And then I started looking back up at Nancy's name. And then I looked at the date it was written. And it was April 16th, 1971. And I thought to myself, that was almost 50 years ago. I really want to know what happened to Nancy. So I couldn't use any of my law enforcement tools. I just had the open internet. And I started Googling 
Nancy McRae. Turns out there's a lot of Nancy McRae's out there in the world. So I had to find a way to pare it down. I found an old listing for the house that's uh, that's listed on the letter. I saw that it was sold years ago to what looked to be her dad. And that was a less common name. I ended up finding his obituary and finding Nancy and her married name on there and this the city she lives in. And then through the white pages, I found her current address and wrote her a letter one day. So about 10 days after I sent the letter, I received an email from Nancy. She couldn't believe that I had sought her out, but she spent most of her life searching out her family members and never thought that someone would actually try and find her. She knew exactly the letter that I was talking about, and she still has the original copy of the letter to this day. She wrote it as a 16-year-old back in 1971. She had always been interested in becoming an FBI agent, and so she wrote Director Hoover a letter in early April of 1971. One day she got home and her mom said, he wrote you back, he wrote you back. He meaning Director Hoover. Nancy was ecstatic and could not wait to open up the letter that he sent, only to find out that she could not be an FBI agent purely based on her gender. So she threw the letter on her bed and never wanted to look at it again. But it turned out that her mom actually saved the letter this whole time. She had no idea how infamous this letter was. After getting a degree, Nancy ended up working and becoming a special agent with another federal agency because she knew that they were accepting female agents at the time. She was on a task force with the FBI out on the West Coast, and she was discussing this letter she received from Director Hoover with an an FBI agent on this task force with her one day. And this FBI agent did not believe that it was Hoover's actual signature on this letter. So Nancy called her mom and her mom was like, yeah, I still have the letter. I'll send it to you. And to the surprise of this FBI agent, it was an actual Hoover signature. Nancy believes that this agent then made a photocopy of it. And from there on out, it's just been photocopied over and over and over and been passed down to female agents in the Bureau ever since. Nancy and I still talk frequently. She was very excited that I'm able to share her story with the world. She's retired now, but she still to this day wants to be an FBI agent and thinks of us often. She is just an absolutely wonderful human being. And I'm so happy that I was able to find her and to let all the female FBI agents know exactly who Nancy is and what happened to her, because we all know her name and we should all know more about her. In the show notes for this episode, you can read Special Agent Christina Reband's full Investigator Magazine article about the Hoover letter and the fascinating story behind why Nancy McRae never applied to the FBI once women were accepted and joined the DEA instead, and why, eight years later, she left the Drug Enforcement Agency. By the way, I had a chance to speak with Nancy McRae, now Patterson. I hope I can get one of my podcaster friends to have Nancy on as a guest to tell her full story. The thing I remember most from our conversation was how sad and angry and frustrated she felt when she opened that letter from Director Hoover so many, many years ago. She said her conversation with Christina and me has helped to heal wounds she never knew she had. Director Hoover was determined to keep women out of the FBI. But just eight days after Hoover's death in May 1972, acting FBI Director L. Patrick Gray III issued a press release announcing that women could finally be considered for the FBI's special agent position. Two months later, on July 17, 1972, Joanne Paris, who had been a nun in New York for 10 years before joining the FBI in 1970 as a researcher, and Susan Raleigh, 
a 25-year-old former Marine, were sworn in as FBI special agents, walked onto the campus of the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia, and began their 14 weeks of training. In the show notes, there's a link to the FBI website and detailed bios for Joanne Paris, Misco, and Susan Raleigh Malone. By the way, Hoover had also been determined to keep minority agents out, but in 1962, the first African-American agents were allowed to attend the FBI Academy. So FYI, we are also celebrating the 60th anniversary of the first modern era Black FBI agents this year. The first female African-American agent, a 26-year-old attorney named Sylvia Elizabeth Mathis, made FBI history on February 17, 1976. She served with the FBI for four years before leaving the Bureau in 1980. You can learn more about Agent Mathis in the show notes. As we review the history of women special agents, I feel it's important to acknowledge women in law enforcement in general, and specifically, women of color. So here's a conversation I had on this topic with my former college roommate, sorority sister, and best friend, retired agent Carol Philip Sidnor. We've been friends since our sophomore year in college. I'm sure listeners are wondering if we're such close friends why I have never had you on FBI Retired Case File Review doing a case review. So what's your excuse? (laughs) Okay. I I have to say that you came to me early on, and because I worked in the field of counterintelligence, and it's all classified work, I wasn't able to talk about any of my cases. I would love to, but you know what they say. If I tell you, I'm going to have to you. But that's the reason why. And and I'm glad you found a way to work me into a podcast because it's really an honor to be on. So you joined the FBI in January of 1986. But prior to that, you were a police officer with the Baltimore Police Department. I can't say that I had some long desire to be in law enforcement. I was attending Morgan State University, and I was in a federal program that hired college students. And once I graduated, I could finish out the summer after graduation. But after that, I was going to be unemployed. A friend of mine who is a member of the Baltimore Police Department told me, why don't you join the police department, go through the academy, and look for another job while you're in the academy. I took that person's advice and At the end of the 16 weeks, I believe it was, I think I was the first Black female to be valedictorian of a Baltimore City police class. I couldn't just walk away after that, so I decided to stay, and I ended up loving law enforcement. I majored in social work, so I came into law enforcement probably with a little different attitude than a lot of people. Now, we're talking back in 1979. What was the reception? It did well in training, but once you were working on the street, what was that like? I felt very respected by my colleagues, but there was a little bit of hesitancy because, number one, I was 23 years old, college grad, head of my class, and Black female. I did have to sort of win people over. I think once I was battle-tested, then no problem after that. Law enforcement, you deal with criminals, and sometimes criminals don't want to be arrested. So I had a few instances where it was a physical struggle to place one under arrest. After handling myself in those situations, my fellow officers were a lot more comfortable. Jerry, you were always on me. Come on, join, join the FBI. You'll love it. And so you recruited me. And I'm honored that you felt that I have what it takes to be an FBI agent. Statistically, women make up 12 to 15 percent of law enforcement. In the FBI, the numbers have grown from when you and I entered, which was about five or five to seven percent, to now being 22 percent. That's movement. 
But I will say when it comes to black female FBI agents, it was about 0.5 percent when we came in. It's now one percent. I mean, there wasn't a lot of black female agents who joined the FBI before we did. But we really need to give tribute to Sylvia Mathis. She came in in 1976, but quit the FBI about four years later. And whenever I look at a picture of her, I feel her pain because I know she didn't have it easy. And I know that because when I came in, I didn't have it easy. I came in at a time when the FBI was trying to do some creative things in order to increase the number of people of color and women. And they had created a ranking system. And many that were in the FBI at the time felt that this ranking system was lowering the FBI standards to bring more women and minorities in. I definitely got that message, even though a number of people let me know that I was not one of the so-called unqualified minorities or, or Black agents who had slipped in. And I joined six years after Sylvia Mathis did. Did you ever experience anything where you felt, either as a woman or as a Black agent, that there were issues? Years ago, I answered a phone call in the office, and there was a, a agent calling from the West Coast who had forwarded a lead to our office. We were having a good conversation, and towards the end of the conversation, the male agent on on the line made a comment about the person's ethnicity. The person was Puerto Rican, and the agent said, as far as he was concerned, a Puerto Rican was a black turned inside out. What was a very cordial conversation stopped, and I just said, okay, I'll pass on the information. The agent called back to the office to inquire about my race. He told the secretary what our conversation and the statements he made, and the secretary was very upset. Realizing what he had done, he made the comment, well, I didn't know she was Black. She didn't sound like she was Black. I was shocked that that kind of attitude was in the FBI because the FBI enforced laws about civil rights. So that was an eye-opener for me. And this was in your very first FBI office assignment? Yes. And I believe I was still on probation when this occurred. So I didn't, I didn't want to report it because I was on probation. And I handled it in my own way. But from then on, any time... I felt like I was running into any kind of discrimination. I didn't want to be a victim. And so I dealt with it. It's always a way to deal with things and it's not without risk, but I didn't want the system to hold me back because of my gender or my race. I don't want our conversation to sound negative, but I want it to be real, real talk. And I can think of an incident that really sums up the ugliness of hidden biases that we had to deal with as women agents and as Black women agents. And that was a story that someone told me about recently. I won't share her name because I didn't ask permission to tell this story, but a retired agent was saying how she had gotten assigned to a major FBI office. Her name is a unique name. And when she walked into the office the first day, her supervisor said, oh, you're so-and-so. And she didn't understand what he meant by that. But then he went to the door of his office and shouted out, this is so-and-so. So you can move that desk back. What she found out was that they thought she was a Black female because of her unique name. And there were members of the squad who did not want to sit next to a Black female. They had moved the only empty desk on the squad area away from where they were sitting. She realized that the supervisor felt that this was acceptable. And the fact that he nonchalantly told them, hey, she's a white female. You can move it back now. Unbelievable. And like you said, we're, we're just talking real talk. And I don't want 
to give the impression that it was a horrible experience in the FBI because number one, I wouldn't allow it to be. I loved what I was doing. I did it well. I was serving the country and I didn't feel like I had to prove to anyone that I was good enough to be in the FBI. It was the best career of my life. I loved it. I'm very appreciative of the friends that I've made and the FBI family. That's what it was to me and still is. I still have very good friends in the Bureau. I feel the same way. I had a very rocky first four years and then a sprinkle of incidents throughout my career, but those are individual and not institutional. You know, I love my career and I certainly felt that I contributed to the mission. But the reason I bring this up is with the number of Black female FBI agents still at 1%, each and every Black female agent and each and every female person of color who enters the FBI is, in reality, a trailblazer still because in most situations, they will be the only one in their office, on their squad, and they may encounter people who wonder if they should be there. After years of being told they weren't qualified, women are now able to join the FBI. But women only make up 22% of the special agent workforce. Many still wonder if it is a job that they can do, if it is a job that's right for them. I spoke with Special Agent Bridget Trella, who comes from an FBI family, about this issue. Agent Trella is currently assigned to FBI headquarters. My name is Bridget Trella. I'm a supervisory special agent currently with the FBI. I've been with the FBI over 24 years, starting in 1998. I always joke that I'm a, a product of an FBI love story because my parents both met in the FBI in 1970. So I feel like I've been in the FBI my whole life. But growing up, I would have never imagined that I would start working for the FBI. And I certainly never imagined that I would be a special agent. And that's because growing up, I looked at my father, who was a special agent, and he was just tough and sports watching and beer drinking and very intense and hardworking and away from home all the time. And I saw my mother, who had worked for the FBI back in the 60s, and she left the FBI after being a secretary to be a stay-at-home mom. And I never saw being in the FBI being a good job for a woman. I wanted to go to college, unlike my mom, who didn't get the opportunity to go to college. But I wanted to have a career as a teacher and perhaps be a stay-at-home mom when I had kids, because that's what I saw in my mom. And that's not what I saw in my dad. Unfortunately, right after college, my father passed away and my whole life changed. I think my dad dying made me focus on needing a professional career right away. I was always interested in what the FBI did, and so forensics was a way that I could be involved with not having to be a law enforcement officer, which at the time I couldn't have ever imagined myself being. So after that point, I was offered a job with the FBI laboratory as a forensic scientist, which seemed to me to maybe be a better job for a woman because um, I would not be away so much. And so I started in the FBI laboratory in 1998. And I really enjoyed my career there. But what that did was give me the opportunity that I didn't have growing up of meeting female FBI agents. And I met a lot of female FBI agents that had worked in the lab and left the lab to become FBI agents. And I also worked with female FBI agents who worked in field offices. And I would work on their investigations in the lab or I would travel to their territory to testify in their cases. And I met many women that were like me, women that were moms, women that were focused on their families, women that weren't like my dad. They weren't tough, beer drinking, sports watching men. And that really changed my perspective of what a female agent could be. So at age 34, by then I had two little kids. I decided to change my career within the FBI. And I left the FBI laboratory and went to the FBI Academy 
and did things I had never imagined I would ever do. I learned how to shoot guns and to box and to wrestle, but I also got to excel at the things that I was good at, which was interview and interrogation and law and applications of really using my personality of interacting with people and enjoying the strategy and techniques in working in investigation. By then, my dad had been passed away for probably 14 years. But when I became an FBI agent, I got presented with his credential number and his badge number. And it was interesting to see the reaction of my mother, who had been in the FBI so long ago and never had the opportunity to become an FBI agent because she worked for the FBI before women could be agents. My aunt had also worked for the FBI back in the 1950s. And I wondered if they ever thought that I was sort of crazy for deciding to become an agent. They both were very proud of me and and excited and very supportive of my career and always interested to hear all the things I've done and the opportunities I've had. To me, being a great FBI agent is to have the very best interpersonal skills and have the ability to connect with people, all sorts of people on an emotional level. And I do feel like women are inherently better at that than men. And as far as women wanting to be mothers and have careers, I honestly think it's a great job for women and particularly mothers, because in some ways it's demanding and in other ways it's flexible. And I think the skill set you have as a mother really lends itself well to being an investigator and operating sources and working with victims. I've met many female FBI agents who are moms, some who are even single moms. And actually, I'm a single mom. I'm divorced with two teenage daughters. And I've even known several female FBI agents who have adopted children and raised children on their own and do a fabulous job. And I actually know single dad FBI agents. And it's interesting, the experience of seeing other agents who help raise your kids and support each other in the greater FBI family. And so if you're out there and you're a woman and you're listening and you're wondering if this job is for me, I encourage you to reach out to any female FBI agents you know or those you can look up on LinkedIn and talk with them and ask them their experiences and ask them all the questions that you're wondering and been afraid to ask. Myself and many other women in the FBI would love the opportunity to share with you our experiences and how it's been a great place and how it will continue to be a great place the more women that become special agents. I often reflect on if my father had not died and perhaps was still in my life, Would I have joined the FBI and would I have been an FBI agent? And I honestly do not know the answer to this question. I do suspect that I would not have followed that path. But following that path, I've found my father. I understand what drove him because I've been driven by the same things. And I understand why he was gone for long hours and why he traveled so much because I do the same. Though he has not been alive in my adult life, I feel like I am living part of his adult life, so it's helped me to get to know and understand him. And the coolest thing to me is that even though I started in the FBI after my father had died, still 24 years later, I encounter people almost every month that knew my father, and they tell me stories about him that I never knew and never heard. And Every time I get a piece of him back, and it's like a gift given to me by the big FBI family, and that has been so incredibly precious to me. And I don't know what my father would think about me being an FBI agent. I think he'd be surprised. I think he'd be proud. But always when I meet one of my father's former colleagues and friends, I ask them what they think my father would think, and they all tell me that he's looking down on me from heaven and he's very proud of what I've accomplished so far. In producing this episode about the history of women agents, I wanted to show the evolution of the role of women agents in the Bureau. I found the perfect opportunity to do just that by comparing the careers of two sisters who joined the FBI 24 years apart. Let me introduce you to Kathy Schroeder and Candace Calderon. This is Kathy. 
And I entered on duty in 1976 through Tampa. And I happened to be the first female that they processed through the Tampa division. It was kind of different how they processed me. You know, I did the normal background testing, physical, all of that kind of stuff. But I was interviewed earlier in the summer only by the SAC. So that's how I got in. They were supportive there with the exception of the applicant coordinator actually didn't prepare me for what Quantico was going to be like. I recall what he said was, you know, did I work out? And remember in 1976, it wasn't fashionable to be fit. So I ran a mile every day, but he looked at me and said, well, he says, you look like a strong girl. You should have no problem (laughs) as opposed to telling me what to be prepared for. Otherwise, they were very supportive. I found out later after I graduated that they kept kind of a secret eye on me while I was going through Quantico to make sure that I made it, I guess. I thought they were reasonably supportive being the first one to come through Tampa. In one of my summer jobs before going to college, I met a couple of agents who I now know were doing a background investigation on someone at the the business where I was working a summer job. And I thought that was interesting. But I went to college. I was encouraged to go through as an accountant to become an accountant. But I realized that in my first year, I really wasn't a fan of it. But I joined the accounting club, which gave speakers once a month. And one of the speakers was a special agent accountant. And I must have asked him 50 million questions about it. And I realized at that particular point in time, if I was going to be an accountant, I would like to use it other than sitting at a desk all day long. And he made it sound like accountants could be a valuable asset to the bureau and doing that. And I thought, well, okay. And so I finished the last three years of my college knowing that that's what I wanted to do. I actually applied at 22 and they had to wait till I was 23 to let me in. Our father was a Florida Highway Patrol. So he was in law enforcement, although he didn't encourage me in doing this because he thought it would be very hard for women to be in this, the law enforcement field. But I thought, you know what? I'm, I can do this. So I was going to do it or die trying. I almost died trying. <laughs> and my first office was Dallas. Being 23 and brand new female agents at that point were like a unicorn. (laughs) There weren't many of them around. So I have to say that the agents, they were a little skeptical and a little reticent to work with a young female agent. Actually, I found out that some of the wives had told their husbands they weren't a fan of of them working with a female. (laughs) which uh, kind of bothered me at first. But what I ended up doing was, you know, attending bureau functions so that I could meet some of the wives and, you know, win them over so they would see that I'm not, you know, a threat or anything like that. And then that actually worked. So once they became comfortable, you know, agents tended to work with me more. When you're a brand new agent, you do all the jobs that nobody else wants to do, kind of get your street cred. And once they saw me doing that, I really didn't have any problems after. I only spent about two and a half years in my first office. By the end of that, they were actually trying to keep me from rotating to my next office. In the beginning, I understand that because we were new that they were going to be put off, you know, a little standoffish, but you win them over by your hard work and you just keep your head down and keep going. And at the end, you know, I had so many friends cried when I left. I came in 76 and Candace EOD as an agent in 2000. There was 24 years between our EOD dates, but there's not 24 years between us. I'm 14 years older, so I'm the oldest of five and she's the baby. Kathy was was coming straight from the family home when she went in. And so very young, as opposed to myself, who was just shy of my 33rd birthday and a single mom of a three-year-old. I was a support employee already. I had been a support employee for about three months when there was a hiring freeze and they canvassed onboard support personnel. I think it's only happened a couple, three times in the Bureau. And as long as you met all the criteria, if you got through Quantico, they'd actually send you back to the office that you processed from. So as a single mom with shared custody, that sounded like a great use of my degree and work experience. So I applied. At that time, my SAC, I think trying to be fatherly, brought me in and suggested that perhaps I should marry an agent rather than become one and uh, proceeded to pick up his photo file 
of all the onboard agents in his office and picked out all the single men to show me. (laughs) And I wasn't offended. I was more humored than anything. But, you know, looking back, you know, that might raise a brow or two. The applicant supervisor, however, sat me down and basically told me that if the FBI ever chose to transfer me, then there was no judge in the country that would award me custody of my minor son if I did this job. I didn't know how to handle that. I felt, you know, like that was kind of a threat. You know, like if you do this, you're going to lose your kid. But I just politely told him I'd cross that bridge when it happened. This would have been probably January of 2000 when this conversation happened. So I I EOD'd as a support person in September of 99, but then went through new agents class in October of 2000. Kathy was incredibly supportive. Absolutely. Of course. You know, she was an assessor at the time. And so she had to be very careful about what she could tell me in the way of what to expect. But I honestly didn't go to her for, you know, advice about the process. It was more about the job and the culture, what to expect at Quantico, the PT tests and things like that. But in one of the senior agents, there were senior female agents there that actually worked on the white collar squad, basically told me if I became an agent, no one would respect me if I came back to Tampa because I had been a typist. And I found just the opposite to be true. Well, having Candace ask me to give her her creds was quite the honor. As a matter of fact, when I found out she was going to Quantico, I also volunteered to be an N.A. counselor so that I could be there when she was going through the academy as much as I could. And then at the culmination of that, being able to hand her her creds was just amazing. I was so proud. There's my baby sis, you know, the oldest giving the baby sis her creds was amazing. I have heard the stories over the years prior to joining the Bureau, and certainly since. And I am just so impressed with what Kathy had to endure and overcome. And she did it so beautifully. Her career is so impressive. For her to give me my credentials was far more meaningful to me at that time than Director Free, as much as I have respect for him. She paved the way for the rest of us to be there. I don't think the women in the Bureau today have any concept of what Kathy and those that came through in those early years, you had to endure and look at you. We take that for granted. You made it so much easier for us. You normalized our presence in every facet of Bureau life. I'm just in awe of what she's accomplished. And the neat thing too is we're fairly certain because she reached out to the headquarters historian, right, Ken, that we were the first sisters to go through at that point in time. I think in talking about the difference of when Kathy came in and when Candace came in is really illustrated through your experiences as firearms instructors. Kathy, why did you decide you wanted to do that? And how many women at the time you came in were firearms instructors? Well, it wasn't first on my mind to become a firearms instructor. When I came through the academy, the bureau taught me how to shoot. I didn't shoot prior to that. So they started me at ground zero. At the academy, I was probably, you know, a high average shooter. But after I rotated from Dallas to Detroit and I met my future husband, he was the Michigan State Police. He was a firearms instructor. He was a record holder in himself in competition. He helped me out. When I started reaching out about becoming a firearms instructor, you always had to send a memo to be put in a file, to be put in line. Well, it was interesting that I actually had a a mole firearms instructor who tried to let me know what was going on, that somehow my memos didn't get to the file, but I would never know that. The uh, One of the biggest things that was put in front of me is that, oh, no, you can't go because anybody who goes has to have shot the possible, which that's a big fat lie. In other words, my memos would go missing so it wouldn't be in the file. They required that PFI required that I shoot the possible to be qualified to go. It wasn't like I was just trying to get something that I didn't deserve. I actually won some medals at International Police Olympics along with a national championship So I thought that my skill level was high enough that I should be able to become a firearms instructor and help my fellow agents, you know, with their shooting skills. 
I was required by the PFI to shoot the possibly before they would consider sending me to be, become a firearms instructor. When I shot the possible in the Detroit division in July of 1984 and received my medal shortly thereafter, the possible is commonly called the impossible, <laughs> but the possible club course started in January of 1940. In the history of the course, less than 4% of all agents who have fired attempts on the required possible course have been awarded a possible club medal. It's a um, 50 yard to seven yard course of fire. I think when I shot it, it was 60 rounds, but it might've been 50. And you shoot multiple positions under time. And it's just a very difficult course. I was able to actually shoot that with my duty weapon, which happened to be a Smith & Wesson Model 10-6, two and a half inch revolver, which I didn't know at the time was a pretty excellent accomplishment. I will brag on her. She's missing the point that, you know, once she got to Quantico as a firearms instructor, they told her no one had shot the possible with a two and a half inch revolver up until that point. So she was the first to do it. In doing that, quite a few of the agents were asking me to help them. And I thought, well, you know, I'm pretty successful at that. So I decided with my husband's encouragement that maybe I should try to become a firearms instructor since I have a little bit of talent in that area. So that's why I wanted to become one. Were your skills accepted and, and well-received at firearms training? Well, when I became a firearms instructor, it was in the Detroit division. And although I had a little bit of pushback from the PFI and a couple of his cronies in order to even become a firearms instructor, when I became a firearms instructor, the onboard agents were so supportive. So they were happy that I was back work as a firearms instructor. As a matter of fact, one of the guys, one of the SWAT guys came up to me my first day back and said, OK, I'm glad you're back. Now I want you to coach me for my possible. So in other words, they were very supportive of my skills and being able to help them as an instructor. So I would say that the onboard agents in Detroit were great, but the onboard PFI and a couple of his closest firearms instructors, cronies, were somewhat hostile to me and tried to set me up for failure a couple of times at firearms. PFI stands for Principal Firearms Instructor, which means that it is your program. You are in charge of all the firearms training for all the agents in the division. You generally, depending on the size of the division, have other firearms instructors that help you with the program. And it's up to you to design what the training will be. I mean, you always have a core outline that comes from Quantico, but it's up to you to expand that and make it worthwhile to your agents. Me even becoming a firearms instructor was a difficult road to hoe because they continued to put all these barriers in front of me before I could become a firearms instructor. Not really sure why. It just happened that way. There weren't any female firearms instructors around, but it was noted by my supervisor and the SAC that maybe my skills were good enough to send me. When I came back, the onboard agents were wonderful. It was just the PFI and a couple of his firearms instructors, not all the firearms instructors, but the guys who were in control. But each barrier that they put in front of me that I successfully handled backfired on them because the harder I worked and the more I accomplished, I kind of caught the attention of Quantico, the firearms training unit. And they were reaching out to me to see if I would like to become an instructor at Quantico. And so by doing that, I'd like to think that my attitude changed from being bitter about what they were putting me through to making me a better firearms instructor because then I actually got a job at Quantico as a firearms instructor, which a couple of them wish they could have done. It was not a pleasant experience through all of that, but the harder I worked to overcome all the things that they said that I had to do to become one made my skill level higher than a lot of folks who had come before me, even though I was a female. <laughs> I was um, at Quantico four and a half years from January of 91 to April 95 before I was transferred to uh, Atlanta. I was told on my transfer in that I was going to become the new PFI and training coordinator. 
because the SAC at the time knew me from the academy. And actually, when I was at the academy, one of my duties was to be PFI for headquarters personnel. And he was one of the folks when he was at headquarters who went through my firearms training. So when he found out I was on transfer to Atlanta, he kind of kicked the uh, guy out of the PFI job and made me PFI, which probably didn't endear me to many of the agents because they loved the uh, PFI there. He was kind of the well-loved guy who got him out early and let him score their own targets, that type of person. He was a lovely man, but you know, so when I came in, I was pretty straight arrow and I scored their target, was not endeared to some of the folks and some of the older male agents were not at all welcoming to me, but you know, you just have to work hard and keep your nose to the grindstone. What helped me is that the SAC who appointed me to that job showed me great respect as did the SWAT team leader who happened to be on HRT when I was at Quantico, which carried a lot of weight in the division because both of them were well-respected, both the SAC and the SWAT team leader. So it translated down. I believe I was the very first female field PFI. So you had to overcome a little bit of reticence, I guess. I got there in April of 95. So it was a year before the Olympics and we were already getting ready for that ramping up. The female agents there were very happy that a female was coming in as a PFI. I actually had several of them come to me that, you know, separately, that going to firearms made them sick to their stomach. They were so nervous about going. And so, you know, you talk to them and find out what the problem is and you work with them. And it worked out grand after the division understood me and knew that, you know, what you see is what you get. They started liking firearms because I'd put in a bunch of combat courses. So they actually did training instead of just getting out early to go to barbecue or golf. When people are happy that you're their firearms instructor, how much better does it get? I was full-time PFI training coordinator in our, in our division. In a lot of the divisions, it's a part-time job. But 23 out of my 30 years in the Bureau was a firearms instructor in some way, shape, or form. And Candace, what's your PFI story? I shot the possible on November 19th of 2004, and I was the 1,401st person to do so. My principal firearms instructor was just the opposite of what Kathy experienced in Detroit. He could not have been more supportive. In fact, he requested, since I was a probationary agent, he requested that be waived so that I could go to firearms instructor school. He was eager to have a female firearms instructor, so much so that the firearms instructor school at that time was held regionally. So we actually hosted it here in Tampa. So he was present for me on that first day when we had to, to shoot all the courses in order to continue through the school. So I really found that incredibly supportive. And then he was present when I shot the possible in the Tampa division. So I could not have had a more supportive principal firearms instructor in the Tampa division. And I was, I was very welcomed in that arena. I was proud of everything that she's accomplished. But the interesting part, Jerry, is that Kathy and I have never shot together. Not at all. I've never had the benefit of her training or tutelage. Just like her, you know, Quantico built me as a shooter. I think that speaks volumes to their program. And I pursued it because I had a kind of a natural talent for it as, as she did. So it's interesting that despite us having a similar talent, we've never worked together. So that's actually on my bucket list, believe it or not. I think certainly because she had done it, you know, there was a little bit of a competitive streak in me, I would say that, you know, of course I wanted to try it and do it too, but our paths were very different. Our careers were very different. Kathy moved around a lot. She, you know, took jobs and was transferred and things like that. And I stayed in Tampa my entire career. My first priority was as a parent. While I have absolutely zero regrets, there were other considerations and factors that, you know, I had to consider in my career that came first. But yeah, I would say there's a little bit of sisterly competition, if you will. But I'd love to shoot with her one of these days. I think, you know, by the time this year comes around, I think we might have accomplished that. I think we're talking about doing that in that next month. If my eyes hold out. <laughs> yeah, see, she's already building in excuses, Jerry. So the beginnings of your career were different as far as the immediate acceptance. But 
What would you both say about how it all ended? You know, when you retired, were there differences in how you felt about the Bureau and how you felt about your career? This is Kathy. And well, for me, because I'm somewhat of an adrenaline junkie, I felt that my career was coming to a close for various reasons, but I still miss what I was doing. I would say that I'm I'm glad that most women didn't have to go through a lot of the hoop jumping I did in the beginning, but that's a natural progression. I mean, because there's more women in, which is wonderful. I'm really, really glad in how things progressed. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, I think the numbers are are growing and that's certainly something to be excited about. There is a bit of a difference between what our mission was 20 years ago and what it is today, but there's room for change. And I had this conversation with our SWAT team leader in Tampa now, told him that one of my regrets was never being a sniper because being a sniper required you to be on the SWAT team. And to be on the SWAT team, of course, you had to go through all the the tryouts, which included weighted pull-ups, which was never going to happen probably in my lifetime. But he seemed to think the tide was turning too, and that CERG was pushing more females on SWAT teams. I think there's a lot yet to be seen. Jerry, we've come a long way, but I still think that there's a ways to go. Of course, Kathy and Candace are absolutely correct. Women in the FBI have succeeded as leaders in the field and in management. During this episode, we talked about Director Hoover's initial rejection and the Bureau's eventual acceptance of women as agents. Let's end the conversation on a positive note by replaying a snippet of my interview from episode 258 with our favorite FBI applicant coordinator and recruiter, Special Agent Serena Coughlin from the Philadelphia Division. Our mission is to protect the American people. And if we do not adequately reflect the customers that we are servicing, we are not going to be as effective in this job. I will say for female applicants, the goal five years ago was in the mid 20% range. And that five years ago was difficult to achieve. For the last couple of years, the goal has moved to 40%. And we've been very close to that. I've averaged around 37% back and forth the past two years. And I know that that's pretty much bureau-wide. And some offices have achieved that 40% goal, which means that the future of the FBI is going to look very different. And that's the end of this special 50th anniversary of Women FBI Agents History Review. In your podcast app's description of this episode, there's a link to the show notes at jerrywilliams.com where you'll find photos and be able to access many of the letters and documents referenced during the show. Next week's 50th anniversary episode features a lively and honest conversation with previous FBI retired case file review women agent guest. This time, I get to ask them about those so-called women's issues like biases and babies. You don't want to miss our conversation. I hope you enjoyed the interview and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. You can show me just how much you liked it by buying me a coffee. There's a link in your podcast app's description of this episode or you can visit jerrywilliams.com and tap on the little coffee cup icon in the bottom right-hand corner of my website. Don't forget to follow FBI Retired Case File Review on your favorite podcast app. Now, this podcast is all about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, once a month via my reader team email, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, You get access to my FBI reading resource, a colorful list of more than 70 books about the FBI written by FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. There's nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. You'll also get my FBI reality checklist where I debunk 20 cliches about the FBI and receive news about what I'm up to and about my FBI nonfiction and crime fiction books. I want to thank you for listening to the very end 
I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.